Um, hello, and uh, thank you for introducing me, Michael John, and uh, thank you all for coming along tonight. Um, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Paolo Antonelli this um, evening. And Paolo is unquestionably uh, one of the most influential and inspiring figures working in design today. Um, she's the senior curator in the Department of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where her exhibitions not only reflect um, cutting-edge design activity and thinking, but they also shape it and transform the way we think and write and um, theorize about design, even the way we do design. And uh, for Paolo, I think um, curating exhibitions is definitely a creative act. It's not just about showcasing creativity. She received a degree in architecture from the Politecnico di Milano, has been a contributing editor for Domus magazine, as well as the design editor of Abitare, and has contributed articles to many other publications, including Metropolis, the Harvard Design Review, ID Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and, the, and Nest. And she also um, writes a column uh, regularly for Seed Magazine, exploring overlaps between design and science, which she's going to talk a bit more about tonight. Paola's first uh, major exhibition for MOBA was uh, Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design in 1995. I was lucky enough to um, go along and see the show. I can still remember how exciting it was to see all these weird and uh, fascinating materials. And in particular, I came across Aerogel for the first time, which is, uh, it literally looked like a cube of um, barely visible solidified smoke. And I think the, the whole exhibition was full of these um, amazing materials. And um, I'm sure there's a whole wave of gener uh, designers out there who have been um, significantly inspired and, and influenced by that show to open their minds to the aesthetic and technical possibilities of these kind of less common and more um, high-tech materials. In 2005, she created the um, groundbreaking exhibition Safe Design Takes on Risk. And um, what was interesting for me about this exhibition was that it, it not only presents the fascinating array of innovative designs that really did make the world a safer place, but include quite a few designs that were more conceptual and kind of posed questions about what safe meant um, around in 2005, especially post 9-11. Um, and um, I think it's interesting that her exhibitions always you know, besides being intellectually challenging and accessible, they always mix um, concrete products that are actually in production and part of our everyday lives, even if we're not always um, aware of them, if they become invisible. And many conceptual projects or speculative projects, often specially commissioned for those exhibitions from designers. So normally these things, I think, are quite separated in the design museum world. And it's lovely to see them all mixing up and interacting with each other. In um, 2008, um, Paola curated the hugely successful um, exhibition Design and the Elastic Mind, which she's going to be talking about tonight, um, also at MoMA. And um, basically the focus was looking at all sorts of interactions between um, design, science, technology, and their impacts on, on our daily lives. It was a very important in exhibition for me personally, as uh, myself and Fiona were fortunate to have quite a few um, projects in that show. And it... Um, helped sort of position and frame a lot of the work we've been doing over years within this broader landscape of um, technological experimentation. And not just us, but also some of our graduates and our colleagues. And as a result of that, we sort of were hovering around the edges for quite a while. And that exhibition pulled us a bit more into a, um, a kind of a public space, which um, um, I think is a quite a new um, experience for us to be working in this larger, larger zone. Um, several of the exhibits in What If um, first appeared in Design and the Elastic Mind, and quite a few of them were done by um, graduates. And I think um, being in Design and the Elastic Mind was a wonderful experience for them. It kind of launched their careers immediately out of college um, in a field that's actually quite specialised and sort of still emerging. I think the exhibition also presented Paolo with um, what must be one of the most unique um, dilemmas ever faced by um, a design curator and whether to euthanize one of her exhibits or not. And um, I'm sure, I hope, she's going to talk a little bit about that tonight, so I'm not going to say too much about it. I don't want to spoil the story. I'd um, like to hand over to Paola now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. That was quite a touching introduction. Really happy. You're a friend and you're an inspiration to me. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for taking time for, from your Christmas shopping on a Friday evening uh, to come and listen to us. Thank you very much. You know, 
Design and Elastic Mind was truly a special exhibition for me personally. You know, sometimes in the life of a curator, there's a show that gives you much more than you gave to the show. And uh, I would like to talk to you tonight, not only about the show, but also about what I learned from the show, because I think that that's, uh, um, that's something that was a, a gift for me and that it's going to really inform what I will do in the future. Design and Elastic Mind started out a little bit as a gamble. And it started out of anger. I believe in anger. Anger really works, and it's, uh, it can lead you to very creative choices. Uh, MoMA is a very complicated institution, also a wonderful one. But every time you have an idea, you have to present it to all of your colleagues and discuss it with them. And the truth is that while I'm supposed to learn and understand art, nobody thinks that they have to learn and understand design. So very often, I find myself explaining concepts to an audience that doesn't really have the complete metabolism to get those concepts. So I kept on proposing an exhibition that was called Natural, that was about organic design today. For some reason, it kept on being rejected and rejected and rejected until I got really angry and I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to present something absurd and, and really complicated. So they'll use that as something to bounce the idea of organic design against, and then I'm going to get my organic design show. I decided to present an exhibition on design and science without really knowing what that would be about. I just made up a really good, nifty presentation. They were really excited about it. <laughs> So at that point, I found myself having to do this show. Luckily, I have really great collaborators. The first one is Patricia Juncosa Vecchierini, who's my curatorial assistant, who's much more than a curatorial assistant. She's really an interlocutor. And then I have the so-called design community. Every time I have an idea, whether it's good or bad, an idea that I have to do something about, I send emails to everybody I know. And I ask them for help, for ideas, um, you know, very humbly. And it becomes a collective process. So Tony got one of those emails and Fiona, everybody. And then I started collecting. And as often happens with all these shows, also the process of curating the show is speculative. And the idea gets shaped and perfected by what I get back, by the feedback. It's a continuous shaping of the exhibition until the show opens. But the truth is that it was so speculative, if we, if we want to call it, call it speculative, that until two days before the show, I could not sleep at night thinking it would be a total flop. And instead it was not. And I was truly amazed by how much people embraced it. Um, the exhibition, as often happens with these shows, was not finite, was not finished. I like to leave it always open so, um, so people can finish it themselves. I think it's a process that makes exhibitions more successful. You can also uh, consider shows that you've been at and the ones that you felt more engaged are the ones where you felt that you could add something yourself. So it worked also from that viewpoint and, um, and it was a complete success. A success not of um, traditional criti criticism, especially in the States, there's no design criticism. You know, all the major magazines and newspapers, which are becoming more and more irrelevant, I should say, have critics of everything, theater, dance, movies, even Scent. The New York Times has a Scent critic, but they don't have a design critic. So whenever there's a design show, either the art critic looks down upon it or some other critic looks down upon it, but nobody ever knows how to review it. So. Not too many reviews, of, well, the New York Times did the review and a few others, but then it was Science Magazine, you know, it was The Economist, it was word of mouth, the things, the reviews that I, uh, that I care the most about happened in the world. Whenever you approach a design exhibition as a curator, you can approach it in many different ways. Where do I go, like this? Yeah, that's the left. Okay, that was the right, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, not the, keep it the other way. <laughs> yes. There's many ways to approach a design show. But because design does not really exist yet in people's consciousness as an autonomous creative discipline, you know, it's very few places in the world where that happens. You, all, you often have to define it by default, um, either putting it in juxtaposition with architecture or with art or with engineering. And I want to show you here one image of a show 
that, um, that I love because I can feel the sweat of the curator, the intellectual sweat, because Philip Johnson would not sweat. But this show was in 1934. Philip Johnson, the very con controversial architect, thinker, and professional provocateur, was involved in MoMA since the beginning. And uh, he tried to do this show, Machine Art, many years before it actually happened, but he was rebuffed, like I was, by his committee of peers that reviewed the exhibition proposals. And so his first shows had to be about furniture, you know, showing old furniture and new furniture, Bauhaus and so on and so forth, until in 1934 he was able to do what he wanted. He wanted to show pieces of machinery, coils, propeller blades, and the famous ball bearing that is still a symbol of the MoMA collection. He wanted to show them on white pedestals against white walls as if they were Brancusi sculptures to create a shock a distance between the viewer and what seemed to be mundane everyday objects that would elevate them to the stature of art. So what he did is he created a distance. The distance was the cinematic or the dramatic tool that he used to impress in people's minds the fact that design is, as I believe too, one of the highest forms of human creativity. That was 1934. Today, we cannot use that stratagem anymore because the public, you, even children, want to have context. Instead of distance, context is what gives objects meaning and elevates them to whatever stature you want to elevate them to. So the job of a curator today is instead to explain in a way that doesn't have to be completely definite and detailed, but that gives you at least a feeling of where the object is coming from. When it comes to a speculative show, see, okay, right, now I learned. When it comes to a speculative show like Designing the Elastic Mind, what you want to give as a context is this idea of fervor, of fever, of, uh, uh, of liveliness, intellectual liveliness that is happening in some parts of the design world and of the science world. In order to get to this exhibition, also the process had to be speculative. And so what happened, something really <clears throat> fortuitous happened, is that um, there's a magazine called Seed. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it was founded about three and a half, four years ago. And since I'm a magazine junkie, I was in one of those magazine stores in Manhattan. I picked it up, and uh, it was an issue number one, and I started looking through it. I saw it was a science magazine, and I saw it was serious, but the articles, instead of being like, 15, 20 pages like Scientific American and totally non-understandable were like two pages and although really studied and researched and serious, I could read them. But the most attractive thing was the graphic design was great, but there were party pages like in Vogue magazines. Instead of being models and socialites, they were like pimply scientists, sorry. <laughs> and they were having a great time and really celebrating science as if it were something fun. And I, I thought it was really charming and wonderful. And so I subscribed right away. And a few months later, I get a phone call. Hi, I'm Adam Bly, and I don't know, you know, if I, I don't know if you've seen it. I founded this magazine called Seed, and I started laughing, and I said, "Please look at your list of 17 subscribers, because I'm there." <laughs> and uh, and he said, "Well, I like what you do," and I said, "Well, I like what you do." And so we became friends, and we decided to launch a series of salons. So once a month, we would throw together designers and scientists at total random. Um, he would offer his best scientists, I would offer my best designers, we would together decide on a theme, the themes range from beauty and elegance to honesty to is truth possible, you know, just all of these different general themes, and we had designers and scientists talk. And uh, it was an audience that at first was um, kind of awkward, you know, that the scientists were telling the designers, oh, I'm sorry, I have no sense of style, as if, the, as if design were style. And the designers were telling the scientists, I don't know how to solve the most, the simplest equation, as if science were equations. So this really uh, cute misunderstandings at the beginning became a real solid dialogue at the end. And it was a fantastic way to go, to try and, as Tony said, try to do something creative also when you do a show. Designing the Elastic Mind was the result of all this. Not all of the objects in the show came from these collaborations. They will probably come in the next two years. It takes a while for ideas to become projects, to become scenarios. Most of them actually came from Tony's uh, course, <laughs> from the Design Interactions program at the Royal College of Art in London, and also from all over the world. And what was interesting about the show is that 
Nobody amongst the curators cared whether the author called him or herself an artist, a designer, or a scientist. We were looking for points of encounter, and in doing so, we really spanned the whole gamut of possible professions that dealt with an imagination of what the world could be in the near future. Everything in the show is made with plausible technologies, technologies that exist, the object does not exist yet, but there's no, hardly any science fiction, maybe a little, maybe I'm stretching it a bit, a little bit of science fiction. But it was the idea of giving people a sense of possibility, not just of imagination. And the exhibition was organized according to the concept of scale. Scale is very important and it's one of the biggest revolutions of our times and one of Adam Bly's and my dreams is to redo powers of 10 to redo, you know, the famous Charles and Ray Eames video that goes powers of 10, that this the guy doing the picnic in Florida, and then powers of 10 of distance, you get into the cosmos, and then you get into his body as if it were, you know, fantastic journey. Uh, we would like to redo it according to the idea of scale of today. And, you know, today scale is not anymore about uh, size, but it's about complexity. So you can get to the really large scale having degrees of complexity that are, don't have dimensions. But, in, you know, so this was a mixture you started at the very small scale, at the scale of the nanobiology and at the scale of the molecules, and then you would move into the scale of human beings, and you see actually the pink thing is Tony and Fiona's, one of Tony and Fiona's projects in the exhibition, um, and then there's Chuck Hoberman's reactive facade over there. I'll get into more details of some of the projects. By the way, if you are interested, the website is still on. It's a great website. It's Flash, so those of you who are allergic to Flash might get a little annoyed by it, but it's a website that lets you wander amongst all these different projects. And then the large scale at the very end of the exhibition, as I mentioned to you, was more in terms of um, a scale that was, um, that was about complexity. So it contained, of course, visions of the cosmos and of cities, but also visions of the internet or of the genome or the hum human genome. So you see, it was, um, it was really a progressive reading of scale that was then interspersed with many other themes. But the biggest overarching theme was the idea that design is a force to be reckoned with for the future, because what designers do best is they take revolutions in science and in technology and they make them into life. They take human beings and their limitations and habits and transform these revolutions into things that we can use. So it was really uh, an idea of trying to position design where it belongs, which is in one of the highest and most important positions in our life. Many avenues and possibilities for designers opened up uh, in my mind from that exhibition. They already existed, but I was able to recognize them better. And I don't know how many of you here work as designers, but until a few years ago, when you decided to study as a designer, you only had as an option furniture and products, cars, and they would be like separate courses where you would basically just, you know, swirl drawings and without really knowing what you were doing, beautiful but not very meaningful, or you had graphic design. Today, instead, so much more is open. Of course, I think the pioneer was really the Design Interactions Program at the Royal College of Arts in London, and there are so many new programs that are modeled right now after it, which is the intersection, really, of design and science. And then there are, as a, another model is the MIT Media Lab, which is an, an intersection of art and technology. And right now, there's new universities in Korea that are modeled after it. So there are more and more, you know, the part Parsons School of Design in New York, they're launching a transdisciplinary design course. And it's very funny because they made me pretend that I was the woman on the street and they interviewed me and I was like, transdisciplinary design, that sounds kinky, you know. <laughs> but so there's all this attempt to really open up because designers are very good at creating teams. Designers don't know about nanoscience and will never know as much as a nanophysicist, but they are usually good at calling up the right nanophysicist. So that's what designers do really well. So one of the avenues uh, was nano design. And this particular uh, slide gives you an example of the meeting of scientists and designers that really worked well. In one, um, in one room in the show, see the alphabet soup at the, at the top left and see this strange thingy here in the center. 
top left is the work of two nanophysicists and biologists from UCLA. It's a new way to mark molecules, to mark proteins, I'm sorry, protein markers. It used to be that protein markers were only fluorescent dyes. Um, now instead you can add to the fluorescent dyes also the letters so the marking becomes much more detailed and it's a real product, it's patented, it comes from scientific research. And instead over here is Typosperma, the work of Odette Ezer, a young typeface designer from Israel who decided as a speculative project that he could try to insert a letter, a typeface and a letter into each spermatozoa in, uh, in, in a human sperm so that each ejaculation would be a different poem. You know, so a completely crazy, a completely crazy idea. And these two projects were next to each other in the show and you should have seen the designers hugging up the, uh, the, the, uh, the scientists. They were so happy to meet each other and so happy to have this short circuit created so that in in the future they could use more of each other's skills. But nano, the nanoscale is really where so much of the dreams of designers and the dreams of scientists come together. Scientists have gotten this taste of building atom by atom, so they are getting more into design, into beauty, which first they were shying away from. And instead, designers and architects are dreaming, dreaming of growing things. You know, the ultimate idea in design and in architecture is to imitate nature because nature knows best. And it's not only form or structure, it's also the inner mechanism and the sense of economy that enables you not to waste any energy and not to waste any materials. And designers and architects believe that through nanophysics they will be able to do so by having an initial, um, how can I say, an initial algorithm, an initial seed that once given energy grows by itself into a building or an object in the most sensible and economical and ele elegant way. So it's two dreams that come together at this scale. Um, and you see, this is the work of scientists. One of the salons that we organized with SEED was devoted to the theme of beauty and elegance. Scientists are afraid of elegance and beauty because they're afraid they have the dumb blonde complex, so they always have to choose the worst PowerPoint background and the <laughs> ugliest typeface, because otherwise their peer will think that they are just frivolous. So we were discussing that openly, and they admitted to that in the salon. It was very funny. But you see here two scientists that are getting kind of cutesy. You know? So this is Paul Rothermund, who was given a MacArthur grant because he invented a way to fold DNA by using proteins, and it's a, it's a scientific process, but how does he show the world the process? Through smileys, of course. And instead, this is Keith Schwab over here, um, who would, uh, you know, he, he spoke almost like a CIA document. Uh, he would blip himself every three words because everything was top secret because he was working for the National Security Administration. But you see, and he admitted that whenever you have, um, whenever you have a nano image, it's never a real image because optics doesn't work at that scale. It always, he's a reconstruction constructed image that, you know, there's like this microscope that almost touches the surface and then sends back uh, the image uh, to a computer so it's reconstructed. So you can doctor it and you can kind of um, work on it. So there's definitely an, in an aesthetic intention to it. We got them to admit it took a while, but we did. Um, and here is this tissue design or bio design or bio art. It's a new branch. All of these new branches are getting their own names and their own courses and Oron Cats, you have to really go see the show if you haven't seen it because there's a lot of it in there. Oron Cats and Yonat Sur and Symbiotica, this kind of itinerating, itinerating peripatetic artists that are now based in Perth in, uh, in Australia but really they're all over the world, are the pioneers. And they had in the show this call, thing called Victimless Leather, which is a little, little coat that is made of mice cells, stem cells of mice. And it was actually alive. You know, they came to the show with an incubator, started the whole process with a scaffolding of proteins, and then they let the cells grow onto the scaffolding. Uh, I was telling before uh, Tony and Michael John that I didn't tell MoMA that I would have something alive in the show. I just put the incubator in because otherwise it would have been uh, a regulatory in nightmare. But what happened is that at some point they went back to Australia and the leather coat was growing too fast. So one's leaves started dangling and the other parts were like inflating like it was an obese coat. And so they sent me an email saying, Paula, you have to stop it. I'm like, well, what do you mean I have to stop it? I said, yeah, you know, you have to stop the 
nourishments in the tubes. And I was like, I have to kill the coat? <laughs> and, they, uh, and they were like, yeah, basically, euthanize the coat. So even though, you know, I've always been liberal pro-choice and all that, I couldn't sleep at night. I was feeling like I was doing death penalty. I was the governor of Texas. So... <laughs> What you do, if you're smart, what you do when you are in this kind of dilemma is you talk to the press. <laughs> so I told, I told some people, actually they were great, the people from The Economist, because I love them, and they wrote a really good article about it. But then we started getting threatening phone calls from evangelical groups. <laughs> and it was it really, this little thing sparked the biggest debate, and you know what? Good. That's exactly what it was meant to do. So I started having the journalists call the people in Australia, said, it's your fault, now you deal with them. But in truth, this is what this kind of art design, however you want to call it, is. It's, it's doing what art used to do. It's really provoking questions and putting people ill at ease. It did, with, it did it with me. So that they think about, and here I'm quoting Tony, not the applications, but the implications of technology. That's really a wonderful quote. So that's what designers do today. They really try to make people think of the implication. And here is the work, actually these two works are in the show so you can see them, of two students of, uh, of Tony's that worked on uh, symbiotic as ideas. This is, actually bio jewelry is not based on symbiotica, but it's a wedding ring that is made with your loved one's bone cells. You know, just take a little bit from the shoulder and then you make your own really, really personal uh, wedding ring. And up on top instead, is the steak of tomorrow. Uh, if you can make steak and beef patties in vitro, what shape should they have? If you can make a steak into any shape, what should it be? And James King decided that it should be the best scan of the best cow that he could find in all of the English countryside. So the cow was not harmed, it's just an MRI scan. So it really is about thinking of the implications in the future. Of course, biomimicry is another very, very big field, and it's as old as the world itself. I was telling you before, architects, designers, Leonardo da Vinci, Bernini, everybody, and I'm always quoting the Italians, but you can also quote the Chinese. I mean, everybody's been trying to learn from nature. And paradoxically, the computer is bringing us closer to nature than we've ever been. The fact that we have this computational capability enables us to really get to the uh, maximum organicism. And people like Neri Oxman uh, and uh, Joris Larman are really, really uh, applying these ideas for the future. And I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but they are mimicking how nature would build bones to sustain a body on a chair, or they are trying to find out the mathematical laws that are at the basis of certain barks of certain trees that absorb the sun in Nordic weather so they can make facades for buildings. So you see the applications exist. There's speculation and also possible applications. But there are, it's almost like the computing cloud. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that are working on these experiments and then linking. And I'm sure that we'll have big breakthroughs, uh, especially because we're pressed by the urgency of the climate, uh, uh, of the climate problems. I think we'll have big breakthroughs pretty soon. I would say 10 years, even though it's not my job to foresee that way. The senses uh, is another field, well, is another field of passion for many designers, especially the all fact, it seems. And I'm showing you here uh, two works that are actually in the show. One is the bees. It's a diagnostic instrument that relies on the fact that bees have a very strong olfactory sense, and they can detect certain enzymes in our breath, um, and they can be trained by Pavlovian reflex to recognize these enzymes and move to different chambers within that diagnostic tool. They can be trained to recognize pregnancy, uh, a certain type of cancer, of skin cancer, and also ovulation cycles. So it's really interesting because Susana Suarez worked with a doctor to specify all that. And then on the bottom right is instead the work of James Auger and Jimmy Loiseau called Smell Plus, which is a dating agency based on smell. So there's a wall between those two people. They just sniff each other. And this idea that we've lost our sense of smell is really an obsession for many designers. Susana did another beautiful project that not only says we have to learn to sniff each other more, but also um, hypo, hypo, 
makes a hypothesis of how to make it socially acceptable over the arc of 70 years. Because, you know, that's what designers do. They don't think only let's do this. They also think, oh my God, how are people going to accept it? So it's nice that way. And in the middle is the work of Emiliana Design, which I really like, which is a counter technological work. It's about um, bringing back some sensuality in life, even when you have a lot of technological um, dimension to what you do. So it's candies that go in between the toes, so your lover sucks it from your toes. And it's chocolate nipples, so they always go into... It's very Spanish in a way. I'm, I'm going over Mathieu Leonard's because it's too long, but, you know, just explore the website when you have a chance. Rapid manufacturing was also a big part of the exhibition. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It means going from a digital file in a computer directly to a manufacturing machine, so there's no human being involved. The computer sends the coordinate to a machine that takes a vat of resin that is either liquid or in powder, and then laser beams meet at precise coordinates and solidify the resin. So you scan the object almost as if you were scanning you know, a body, and you've gotten to the point that you can make such precise things and actually Michael John had uh, some of this in a previous exhibition about fashion and technology but you see at the top left that kind of woven chain is actually not woven it's scanned up so you can make really um, almost like a I've seen it actually. You know those filigrees, ivory filigrees from India where you can make a ball within a ball within a ball with the elephant after 15 balls? You can do that to that point. It's really amazing. Uh, but the funny thing, oh, and that up on top, you see the sketch furniture. It was actually in the show. Special software that captures your motion in the air and then sends it to the manufacturing machine. So there were these pieces of furniture that were actually sketches by these four women designers from Sweden, sketches in the air. And at the same time, you have Tomas Libertini that says, OK, I want to do slow manufacturing. So he takes 40,000 bees, puts a queen bee in the middle, makes a scaffold that is in the shape of a vase, and then the bees make the vase. So it's funny, you know, once again, speculative. And what might have seen something just cute a few years ago today becomes speculation. It becomes a response to, radio, to rapid manufacturing. I like this banter that designers have today. Of course, there are some designers that still do furniture for galleries and, you know, and, you know I'm happy they exist, but I'm really excited about this intellectual pursuit that is playful and very, very serious at the same time. Design for debate is how Tony and Fiona called it, and uh, you know the implications instead of the applications, uh, being a thorn in the side of society and of corporations. And I like how they do that. It's about creating scenarios that show you what if, and that's the title of the show. It's typically what condenses their philosophy of design. What if? All right, so if we go in this direction with cell phones, and I remember that cell phones was one of the first uh, uh, fields that they tackled. If we go into this direction, what will happen? Um, we can become less social, we can become more social. You know, so it's uh, thinking of the possibilities and the consequences. Um, you have in the exhibition all the robots, so you can go and see it. It's a beautiful installation that uh, thinks of robots. You know, we all think that robots will be like Rosie's from, Rosie from the Jetsons and will take care of us, and instead these robots are really neurotic and needy, so you have to talk to them and deal with them for a while before they start having any kind of utility. But, you know, it's a what if robots were to be like that? Or another beautiful example by Michelle Goller is these uh, digital remains. You know, today we, um, you know, we live in a very technologically savvy society, but we still mourn in very old-fashioned ways. So in st when, we, when we die today, we don't live only if we have them, clothes, houses, cars, and money, or nothing. But we also live behind our computer that has all of our life, all of our music, all of our pictures, um, so much of our life. So you can leave all of your digital belongings in these beautiful urns that are crafted by hand and in reality are hard drives that have Bluetooth connections. So after you pass, somebody can put the urn next to their computer and by Bluetooth connection your desktop appears and your digital remains are there. And similarly, Augur Loiseau also did another beautiful um, project 
these projects are at the same time beautiful and creepy, and many of these Design for Debate projects are like that. But it's about uh, distilling the juices, the gastric juices of a corpse, and transforming into, into acid for batteries. So you power a battery, and your loved one lives on as pure energy. So you can see very well, but this battery says, John Adams, 1959-2001, shine on, Dad. Yeah? And they suggest that it could go to power a flashlight or even a vibrator, you know, just like this continuing life. So, and Noam Turan up there, Noam is a really interesting f film, um, film director and designer who works a lot also with Tony and Fiona on their films. But in that case, he had designed this series called Accessories for Lonely Men, uh, based on the idea that when a relationship breaks up, what you really miss are not the beautiful memories, but the most annoying things. Those are the things that bring tears to your, to your um, eyes. And so he created this series of objects that recreate annoyance from the other person your life. So that, that thing, for instance, steals your sheets at night in the bed. And then there are many others, and it's really poetic. It's really quite beautiful. So once again, what if? The, um, another interesting consequence of technology, uh, implication of technology, is how it changed the balance between our social life and our individual lonely life. You know, and uh, okay, the adage is kind of boring and you've heard it before. You can be totally alone in a subway train in New York on a Friday evening at six because you have your iPod and you're completely isolated. Or you can be at home physically lonesome but in reality plugged into all your social networks. So the modulation, how you're you're able to control your interface with, with other people has become really crucial and many designers are working on it, especially Augur Loiseau, once again, you know, they, they've experimented a lot here. They have a series of, of robots that transform insects into energy. You can see them upstairs. But in this case, they created like the social telepresence enables you using a military technology, uh, enables you to, for instance, experience a date. You're too shy to go on the date, so your friend goes on the date, but you're, you're wearing this helmet, so you're by yourself and you're just going through the whole date. Or the thing that's floating over there is the idea that we hardly ever have a, a, a kind of tranquil phone conversation anymore, so a conversation could become almost a spa experience, so you get to go to the spa, you get a massage, etc., et and then you make a phone call in, floating in the pool in this beautiful, uh, in this beautiful kind of helmet that, you know, just the idea of making a conversation is a really relaxing, beautiful way to connect. Connecting also with technology is what I'm interested in focusing in for the future. Um, these are pieces that were in the show. They were actually some of the best hits of the show, especially the one on your right, which is the Shadow Monsters. Very simple software that transforms your Chinese shadows, as we call them, into monsters, adding also sound and people were going crazy even the most dignified and and kind of you know wooden people that i knew were going nuts in that room but the idea that you can really interact with technology in a way that is completely seamless that is totally natural is what i'm really <laughs> focusing on now i don't know if you're familiar with graffiti research lab i love these guys they invented a technology to basically tag buildings and walls by using lasers so it's totally reversible it's totally it uh, doesn't hurt anybody, but somehow the gesture, the graffiti gesture is still so subversive that everywhere they go in the world, p the police come, you know, it's, it's always like this big deal. And also we invited them to the opening of the exhibition at MoMA, so they performed. And of course they still have, you know, it still has to be subversive. So they're at MoMA, they're anointed, but they have to write fuck you snobs, you know. So it was really, it was so sweet. And there were two teams, so there was the, the guys and the girls, and they were wearing the bandanas, you know, the whole spiel. And the guys were down on the floor of the atrium, so they're the ones that wrote fuck you snobs. And the girls instead were up on the fourth floor, and they were instead doing the most beautiful beautiful work and they were actually, it's, it was really interesting, all of these cliches and stereotypes thrown together to make a quite beautiful performance. Information architecture and visualization design is an enormous branch for the future. And the interesting thing is that many architects are moving into it. Architects are very frustrated. They've always been frustrated, huh, Paul? Yeah, they've always been frustrated, but today even more because there's not much work because of the economic crisis. So they found a way to use their skills in the virtual world, um, helping people deal with the enormous amount of data that we have today. You know, the, the faster and the better the computational capabilities are, the more we have to 
make sense of the data um, and uh, visualize it for other people. So whether they're scientists or whether they are instead a wide public, there are many designers and architects that are working precisely on this. Um, and uh, it ranges from something as speculative and beautiful as top right, which is to watch a computer think while it plays chess with itself. And this is only a static still, but it really is the motion is fantastic to bottom left, uh, looking on time at the diagram of different edits on Wikipedia. Uh, we had in the show two controversial edits. One was chocolate and the other one was abortion, where people had a lot of opinions. And so each color corresponds to a particular editor. And on time, you see the battles between editors on Wikipedia, correcting each other and denying each other. So, and it's beautiful. It looks like a Missoni tapestry. So um, once again, anytime you visualize something, you always uh, are giving an opinion. It's like reporting. There's no objective reporter because just how you begin and where you put your commas is already a statement. And the same with visualization design. So it's a very uh, aware, self-aware profession. Dynamic visualization is fantastic. You know, unfortunately, I don't have the videos here, but looking at all the flight patterns over the United States in time or looking at all the IP conversations in and out of New York City at different scales or the screen on the right looking at how people connect with each other on dating agencies on the internet. A lot of this har uh, harvesting of data whether they are data from the aviation authority or from the internet or from you know Google and, and Verizon are me methods to visualize visualize how the world lives and really give a better sense and dimension of how people live. Yeah, I just showed you this. This in particular is, an, uh, is a way for me to show you how uh, information, oh my God, I'm already 35, damn. Well, information design is really a powerful political tool because in this case, it shows how many blocks in Brooklyn have people that are kept in prison or outside of society by the government of the United States. And each block um, represents, each red block represents an expense of more than a million dollars a year. So it's about saying something outrageous about society and also about expenditure. So. Design is a political act, and many designers are working directly on social design, working with aging people, with obese people, um, with convicts and ex-convicts. And also many people are working on um, the bottom of the pyramid, you know, the famous uh, theory by the Indian um, economist Prahalad. Yes, that says that the bottom of the pyramid, the so-called poor of the world, are not a burden, but rather a, a possible uh, revenue, um, a revenue source, because they are clients only if you readdress the way you design products. So many people are working, many designers are working on that. And many architects are readdress, redressing their own capabilities towards socially meaningful information design. This is Diller Scofidio. I'm sure you, you've heard about them. They're really interesting architects based in New York, who worked with Paul Virilio on a great exhibition in Paris last year that was about great migrations in the world. So it really is about addressing not the applications, but the implications of where we're heading. And I wanted to show you this because Ant Farm was doing the same thing a little bit in 1975, but what changed from the 70s to today is the violence and the aggressiveness of the message. I love art and design of the 1970s, and they reflected the tough times that we were going through, and they were all about uh, fire, they were all about explosions. Today, people like Dunn and Raby don't use fire and explosions, but they use something that is even more powerful because they get under people's technological skin. And, you know, and it's really something that lets the individual think at night, what if. Um, this video, you know, I, okay, I'm going to go a little over, just a little bit, because I want to show you this video. Um, things are really happening in this direction right now. This is a video of a very, very recent project by Dan and Raby, so recent that Tony cannot even present it because only Fiona knows it. No, I'm kidding. But I just, I just saw it. I was in Singapore with Fiona at this Congress, and Fiona presented this beautiful, beautiful project. The idea is that uh, it was based on how will we be able to eat in the future when the population will, will reach 8 billions and the resources will remain the same. Um, so 
Tony and Fiona thought about trying to eat things that we usually cannot eat, shrubs and other undigestible things that contain nutritional elements but are not digestible. And they do so by basically outsourcing digestion. <laughs> they have all these prostheses that are um, exterior digestive systems that enable humans not only to eat and digest but also to find new sources of nourishment. And you see, this is the very beginning. It's a, a beautiful video, it's a beautiful sketch, but already it has started a debate, because I understand that Fiona was just two days ago in Germany, where genetic engineering is taken really seriously, and she found herself in the middle of a very heated debate. You know, so it's about using the imagination of designers and the knowledge that designers have of human beings to spark new debates. And I don't think that anybody else could do this. That's why I think designers are so crucial today to our life. Nobody else can do this. I mean, a film director might, but he would need to ask some experts some help. A scientist couldn't because a scientist wouldn't know how to communicate it in a way that is so compelling. Um, and neither could a writer, because a writer, unless he asked a designer, would not be able to get into such detailed uh, knowledge of how human beings want to live. So I think that designers, because they are the repositories of not human secrets, but simply the human dimension today, the one-to-one -one scale, are really so, so important. I'm going to proceed with this, yeah? And... Uh, I'm going to skip this, this is my next show, but I'm going to get to um, tell you something about this slide that I really love. We were talking about the ease with technology and the capability of moving really, really seamlessly and with ease between the dimension of, I don't even want to call it the virtual, but the computer screen or other digital uh, applications and instead the physical world. There are many designers that are the ones that I'm really focusing on today that like to work in the interstitial space. This is a, um, a diagram that was created by Area Code. Area Code is a company that you might know um, that does really video games that are in the real world. For instance, there's a, a game that you can play that's called Shark Runners, and you can play on your computer, but you are, um, you are a scientist following real sharks in the ocean. They are sharks that the uh, San Diego Oceanography Institute has tagged. And so you can follow them and you can actually speculate with other scientists. In the past, they did a show whereby they took Minneapolis and they transformed the whole city in a big game board. So on the computer and in real life you could play the game or the one of the most beautiful applications is the one on the right hand side I actually did play it the idea is that you play a sort of Pac-Man but it's based on uh, 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 pa um, Daddy Samdi which is a New Orleans character so it's like death, uh, but it's a, it's a virtual Pac-Man, so on your computer you have, on your cell phone, you have uh, the, the map of the city, in that case it was downtown Manhattan, and you are on it, and you have uh, Papa Samdi that is like looking for you, but Papa Samdi does not exist, it's only on the telephone, and still you're terrified running along the streets in Manhattan. So I love this, because we don't even have to think about it, that's how we live today. So I really like that particular dimension, and even though we already attempted a few times to get into it with Second Life and with other virtual worlds, and it hasn't worked yet because the technology is not there and they really are as, um, they're as unsatisfying as the real world sometimes. You know, yeah, I mean, too many velvet ropes and too, many ba too much bad architecture. But, you know, we will get there. And actually, one of the commissions in Design and the Elastic Mind was about a world, that, a virtual world that was not a complete democracy in that everybody can access everything, but not everybody can build. They have to go through a committee. I'm sorry. Democracy doesn't work with design. But um, I really am interested in that. And I'm interested also in uh, pushing the idea of uh, the physical as being a obsolete. I mean, we need physical objects, but we don't need them all the time. And you've heard before the idea that many objects that we have today exist as access to systems. Our mobile phone is just a means to an end, and so is this pointer. Um, that's why I am trying to break that boundary also with museum acquisitions. And I wanted to leave you with these two acquisitions that I'm working on. One is a 747. I want to acquire it for MoMA, but I don't want to have it physically. Of course, it wouldn't fit, but also I don't want it physically. 
I wanted to keep on flying. It would be an agreement made with an airline and there would be three aircraft. I've already checked with the aviation authority. I could put the MoMA accession number on the side and it could keep on flying with the airline. And there are three of them that are the MoMA airplanes. And uh, if you by chance take a flight and it's the MoMA airplane, you get a special boarding pass and so you collect it. And then maybe the upholstery fabric is different, not the configuration. The configuration inside is the same, but you know, the onboard library doesn't have only golfing magazines. It has, has architecture and design magazines and the cart sells MoMA store items because you always have to think of commerce. But you know, the idea basically, seriously speaking, is that you don't need to possess an object to say that it's worthy of the MoMA design collection. It can be something that you almost tag, you know, tagging also when it comes to the collection. And the other acquisition that I really want to get to is the at of the email sign or the email addresses, which is a wonderful story. It's basically a design act because that, uh, that character ha existed since the Middle Ages. It used to be a way for medieval monks that would, were you know, writing by hand to save time by creating a ligature, that's how it's called in music and in rhetoric, a ligature of at, of A-N-T, so an ad in Latin. So they were trying to be economical. And then that particular letter existed also uh, in the centuries. In the 17th century, it was used by merchants in Spain and Portugal to establish a report between price and weight. So it still had this relational character. And then even in the 19th and 20th century, it existed in American typewriters and it was called the commercial at. It was used by accountants mostly. And when Ray Tomlinson, uh, together with a partner, was creating the internet for DARPA, for ARPA, for the military of the United States in 1971, he wanted to find a ligature to collapse all of those characters of code that he needed to say this person at that machine. And he looked at the keyboard and he saw this character that nobody used and he decided to use it. So it's such an economical and beautiful act. You know, it still it maintains the character that was there in the centuries. It, no need to redo keyboards. It's a great design object. Um, I think that the more designers go beyond furniture and beyond posters and show the world what they can do, the more they'll gain presence and the more they'll benefit also society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Walter. Thank you very much. You're that was very a welcome. wonderful and inspiring talk. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, a little bit uncomfortable seeing my own project presented much better than I would. <laughs> but um, I think the idea is that we, I'll ask you a few questions to kind of um, open things up and then we'll open it to the audience um, after about 10 minutes or so for another 20 minutes. Um, You've actually, um, I had quite a few fairly straightforward questions that you've already answered. Oh, so sorry. I have to go on the more uh, complicated ones. <laughs> but um, before that, you, you had to rush there at the end and you mentioned that you had some ideas about the projects you're thinking about and mm -hmm. that you'd um, like, you know, that are up and coming. Would you like to say a little bit more about that? Absolutely. <clears throat> With these mics, you can't really do a little burp. You know, you have to be careful. <laughs> I'm like, oops. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the next exhibition that I'm working on is called Talk to Me, and it's about the communication between people and objects. So it's a lot about interfaces, a lot about interaction. It's about, once again, real world ATM, you know, bank teller machines and, um, and interfaces that we use all every day and better ones that have not been created yet. And immersive worlds, I'm still working on it, you know, and it's still in that big magma state at the beginning. But then I'm also... Uh, I, will, I haven't presented it yet, so it's almost a secret amongst us. I also would like to show, to do an exhibition called Monsters in the Garden that is about taking the best and most gorgeous construction machines in the world and putting them in the MoMA Sculpture Garden and doing like a Jurassic Park with also a sound designer and a really serious book on construction machines. So, I mean, truly, ideas are... A, a dollar a pound sometimes. I mean, not that they're not valuable, but there are many. It's the ones that you decide to actually make happen. That's why I'm hoping that one day we'll have a way to only count on our own time and, uh, and workload in order to make ideas happen in a virtual world. So maybe it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> 
And one thing I'm quite interested in, you, you touched on it in the talk, was this um, relationship to science fiction. And, um, you know, it's always very difficult, to, especially with the speculative work, to draw that line on the one hand between sci-fi and just kind of imaginative thinking. But also, again, another thing you touched on, but I'd like to hear more about is what, what you feel the difference is, you know, that you were saying that design can offer more, but what, what that more is in, in comparison to a really seductive, beautiful sci-fi film or a really intriguing, in-depth novel. Well, um, I love science fiction. I, I'm dreaming of teleportation every single day. And uh, when people ask me, what's your dream technology, I say, that's it. I even went through a long scenario about teleportations where you would go to Grand Central Station. There would be the normal track and then the teleportation tracks. I mean, it, it really, I, I love science fiction, but I think it's a little too easy. Um, when I used to teach um, a, a very big group of students that were coming from the whole campus at UCLA, what design was, I would often get the question, what is the difference between art and design? And I would simply say, um, an artist can choose whether to be responsible towards other human beings or not. And instead, a designer has to be by definition. Uh, similarly, when it comes to the difference between speculative design and science fiction, science fiction can imagine anything, you know, uh, even something that does not relate to our physical properties, it doesn't matter, anything, everything is game. A designer instead has to deal with reality still, and speculative design uh, is, stretches design to the limit and pushes us to the very, very limit of what's possible. To me, that's much harder and much, much more challenging, even though sometimes I might have more fun watching a science fiction movie. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, I read somewhere recently that uh, you, there's a lot of talk at the moment about, you know, can design save the world? What can designers do to save the planet and all this sort of thing? And I think you pointed out that's a rather bombastic yeah. sentiment for designers. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we can do is improve the world in some way. But faced with massive challenges like climate change, I mean, how do you, do you have kind of ideas about how design, you know, obviously we're not talking about you can't actually solve and fix the problem. We can't really save the world. What kind of relationship do you think young designers could have to these sort of big issues that are kind of in the background all the time, or the foreground at the moment? A lot. You know, I, I believe there are some people that can change the world. You know, Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. You know, just there yeah. are these people that have this, um, this really defined role. Uh, when it comes to designers, maybe some of them will be so public, but I think that we can all do a lot. I just don't like to say we're saving the world, we're just doing our bit. I believe really in working all together and we all do our bit. And some designers, I mean, many designers work already in that direction. And uh, it goes from doing the speculative work that you do or that Amy Franceschini, many other people do, you know, speculative work, or it goes to educating um, corporations about, you know, less waste, a better way to produce. I was very interested, I heard um, the, I don't remember the exact title, it was somebody working for Nestlé that was a designer within Nestlé or in head of design innovation and he was thinking of a way to ship ice cream not frozen and have it frozen at the end. You have no idea of how much gas that would save. You know, just like things like this. So this is incremental. So there's somebody thinking like that. There's somebody else eliminating a type of packaging. There's uh, another one that is instead putting out in the world the possibility of another one was uh, growing mushrooms as they were being tracked across Europe. So there's many wonderful people doing their enormous bit by themselves. And uh, it's about humility and clarity, I think. And designers can do a lot because they can show many of these disparate people that things can really happen. The, the capacity of synthesis of designers and visualization is really strong. Hmm. Just have one more question, then I'll, I think I'll open it up. Um, traditionally, for some reason, in 3D design, 3D design maybe more than, product, more than architecture and graphics, there's a real kind of aversion to theory or almost a, a repulsion from theory, yet as we're moving into more and more complex times, it seems like theory could be a very useful tool for us. I mean, why, why do you think there's this very specific aspect I of design is so anti-intellectual and anti It's so funny, I have no idea. I've been thinking about it a lot because, first of all, what is theory? If by theory you intend the endless discussion, quoting Baudrillard and Lyotard around the table, you know what, I, I've had enough of theory too. But 
discussion, more discussion is certainly important, and then you can bring in also Baudrillard and Lyotard because they deserve it. You know, but um, architects are very different. Like, you no, know, there was a moment in, in the United States where it was all about quoting Derrida and quoting philosophers, and nobody was building anything, and they called it conceptual architecture. Now. Maybe because design is moving into conceptual design, it will move also into more theory, even though I'm sure that there will not be the same kind of quoting philosophers all the time. But I think it's, um, it goes with the territory. When all of a sudden you stop making, 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 and you start thinking twice before making something, you need to have theory. So that's why more theory is happening. Hmm. I, I guess, think. Yeah. But you should tell me more, because you're the one that's actually... Well, I, I think we're kind of anti-theory as well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it's more, uh, in a way, as you were saying, how to think and discuss and then translate those thoughts and ideas through the material world mm -hmm. into, into more concrete outcomes. But I, like you, I, I have enough of you know, a parallel channel of theory and a parallel channel of activity that never seems to, to meet. Right. I hope, I mm -hmm. hope the designers who are moving into a more intellectual space will avoid that pitfall, for sure. Mm -hmm. I hope so, yeah that necessity has always been considered to be the mother of invention. And therefore, no matter how one projects, imagines, or all of the other abilities that different people have, may I ask you if you could visualize that necessity is an absolute uh, motor long before any of the other ideas of theory or any of the other factors you have referred to. I completely agree with you, and I regret not using the word itself, necessity. Um, maybe it was too taken for granted. I mean, we spoke a little bit about urgency. But necessity is definitely a very, very strong motor. And interestingly, when I was in Singapore two weeks ago with Fiona at this World Design Congress, uh, there was a, a very, very impressive Minister of Finance, speaking of the government of Singapore, that was saying, you know, all of these great ideas that they had in mind, and at some point he turned to the audience and said, you know, of course it helps to have no choice, you know? And interestingly, urgency and necessity usually is where the best of design comes from. And I'm sure that Tony and Fiona always think of this idea of urgency because there's always some anxiety to their projects, you know? So a sense of anxiety that is always making you feel that you better do that or it's the what if. So I agree with you. Thanks for this note. Okay, I think, did you put your hand up? Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> and I can remember years ago uh, moving to Italy and being struck in when you're suddenly in, a, in a, an environment of society where people really appreciate design. Yeah. Clothes, <laughs> furniture, shoes, everything. Um, and then in comparison, you think of lots of other countries where um, there's very little interest in design. Um, I used to live in the UK, yeah. and I don't think there is a huge amount, really, amongst okay. people. And it makes me think of the idea that, um, I was wondering your views on it, almost like you know, catching in the phrase of democratizing design. And by that, I mean not dumbing it down, but the idea of trying to, say, translate the ideas of design um, to as wide a number of people as possible. Because lots of things that you talk about, to me, seem to be that it, you end up consciously making a decision um, and thinking of, what, of, of your actions in some way. Um, and then that idea of, you know, of democratizing design, I was thinking, is that one lever to address that bigger, bigger issue that you mentioned of you know, dealing with climate change or financial meltdown, or whatever it is? I was wondering if you have Yeah, no, this is, um, oh yeah, but it's not only me. There's a lot of the design world that's thinking on it, uh, of it. And uh, there are various theories. There are some people that come, especially from a corporate design background, that have, are trying to establish this idea of design thinking. I don't like the slogan, but I like the purpose. Well, the initial purpose was to try and convince more companies to buy their services, of course. But um, it can be used also in a non-cynical way. 
uh, it's the idea of divulging a sort of method. You know, like people know about the scientific method. They might not know exactly how to apply it, but they have a sense. So the idea was to apply, was to explain a design methodology, you know, which is based on the idea of uh, creating prototypes, thinking of the what if, always building scenarios. Um, that's one way to go. Another way to go is to expose people to as much design as possible and describe it, you know, which is what I try to do. Maybe we have to come to it at the, at the same time. In the sense that I think that uh, people design every day, and I'm not saying it to be cute, it's the truth. People make design decisions. And also when they come to design show, they might come to MoMA to see Matisse and Picasso. Um, and not thinking that they want to come for the design show, but then they stay longer and they respond um, more wholeheartedly to the design show. So people know about design intrinsically. I think that we have not, in many places in the world, we have not found a way to position it in the cultural dresser yet. But you know, to your um, observation about Italy, each country has, or each city has a different strength. I personally believe that the UK has a lot of sense of design, but it's more of an, an engineering kind of design, but it, I find the UK very sophisticated in design. Italy is all about the style kind of design. Then you come to the United States and to New York, and people don't know about design, but their habit with contemporary art is amazing. And instead, I learned nothing about contemporary art in Italy. So different places have different you know, uh, um, comfort zones in culture. And what is nice is to try and uh, open them to other influences. What do you think about the idea of explaining more design to more people? Um. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's something that comes up a lot with our work, a kind of related thing, is whether, not so much a lot of people, but this idea of elitism and addressing minorities and showing through museums and, and things like that. And that's kind of got me thinking about the idea of, of design in relation to um, large groups of people. And I feel that you need all the different groups. You'd, you know, even people who go to art galleries still need to be challenged about the role of science in their life. It doesn't mean that because you're addressing those people, it's somehow elitist and exclusive, and it should all be aimed at, at a kind of massive audience. Mm -hmm. But um, like you, I think some of these new developments or recent developments like design thinking are, are very interesting for you know, two things, really. I think in the UK in particular, it seems to be taking off at the moment, but in a sort of a scary way, almost as a almost in relation to government um, kind of mm -hmm. um, wishes and desires. So it almost could be imagined as a form of sneaky social engineering. <laughs> and that side of it really disturbs me. But then as a sort of way of spreading design out of the design profession into other areas, I think it's extremely interesting. But I'm not sure, I haven't really seen good examples of it that convince yeah. me mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> about three weeks ago, I co-hosted an exhibition with Julia Casson from right. the oh, yes. yeah. And there was just the experience then of seeing design teams partnering with a design partner who had never experienced that before. In that particular case, there was usually something related to some limited ability, say sh short stature or something. And the experience of that person working with professional designers and um, feeling quite amazed by that experience and coming up with amazing designs. There were five, you have to talk to Julia about it, there were five amazing ideas that came out of it, out of the blue, just because you had that dialogue taking place which would never normally take place. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next. I was just uh, intrigued, uh, Paola, by the um, the, the 747 and the at sign, and uh, they seem to be two extremes of, of collecting in a sense. And I, I get how you can tag the jumbo jet, but I'd, I have find it more difficult to understand uh, how you do the at sign, uh, how you collect it. Maybe you could. Uh... Well, um, once again, it's about 
not needing to collect something specifically. If you wanted to know exactly the details of the collecting, the acquisition itself would be the ad sign in the original typeface of the Model 33 typewriter that Ray Tomlinson used, right? So it's that particular typeface. And then every time we print the ad sign in another typeface, we indicate in the label what typeface it is, as if it were the, math the material of an object, you know? So, um, and it doesn't really matter. What we have in the collection is the ad sign, and everybody has the right to have the ad sign, so everybody can have it, just like everybody can have a post-it note, and it's also in the MoMA collection. It's the extreme idea of design. Design is at MoMA because in the founding director's mind, it was the chance that every person in the world had to have art in their lives, even if they didn't have much money. So, A, the ad sign is the extreme of that, but I feel that it all flows from the same idea, which is that of um, design being something that goes into the real world. It got me wondering, um, I mean, w w when you think of uh, whether it's an educational curriculum or uh, a factory process or a, a military campaign, Mm -hmm. You know, um, in some sense, you could all say they're subject to design. So, is there anything which is beyond the purview of design? Yeah, I, I try. I made? stop. I stop at the at the at the five senses. Not even the six. The five senses. Yeah. To me, there needs to be at least one of the five senses involved, because otherwise it becomes too much. Now, I'm working on a symposium on scent as a form of design, and. I don't know if it would be right for MoMA to collect the Chanel 5 perfume. I think it's a little too much. I, I think that when it comes to MoMA, I want to keep something visual happening. Um, but, so I know my context, MoMA is one thing, but I think we can do the at without any problem, scent, no. But if I had to go outside, I would not do an exhibition on music as a form of design because I'm ignorant, but somebody else could, and I would, go and try to understand. Scent I can get to still, but everything that has senses involved, I consider part of my world. Thank you. Actually, there was him. Yeah, um, this is a comment more than a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you were talking there about how to bring an awareness of design as thinking rather than just as uh, a thing that happens. And I think that um, to bring it to everyone, you almost have to as you said, contextualize it. And for me, I've no background in uh, design, but I've become aware of design thinking um, by being introduced to a Mac, as opposed to the PC that I had previously, you know, interacted with. And for me, that kind of raised the whole debate of Mac versus PC and, you know, Mac bringing, let's say, elegance of design into something that I take for granted. And I wonder, is, is that not the way to do it, is to take things that people normally interact with, for example, mobile phones, and say, this is good design in a mobile phone, this isn't good design in a mobile phone, or for example, with, with cars, you know, like everyone drives a car, and people know that there are differences in how cars operate, but it's never couched in design language, or at least design thinking about how that interacts with your life. And almost it's, I think that maybe the job of a designer isn't just to create great design, but it's to step in to the debate and introduce a design perspective. You know, whether that's, for example, when a radio station decides to have its news, is it at 12 o'clock or is it a quarter to the hour, and how does that impact on people's enjoyment of a radio show? Or if it's on, like within an Irish context of how you organize your government and whether voting for TDs on local issues or your representatives on local issues and how that impacts on national, how the country is nationally run. So I think it's almost that, the, uh, the, I think that there needs to be more spokes people yeah. in design in society who are designers. No, I completely agree with you, but not only, they don't need to be designers per se, but um, I'm always complaining that there's not enough coverage of design and what I would dream of would be a really, really good writer writing about design in a compelling way. Um, so to write an essay about design that is as fascinating to read as an essay on baseball. I, I couldn't care less about baseball, but if something is really well written, I might even read, read it. I would like the same to happen about design. And sometimes I, I say that I would like people to be as cognizant of design as they are, for instance, of music and politics, as you said, or movies, you know, like, I can't say that everybody's a movie expert, but at this point in life, we all know what a director of photography does and what a production designer does. And that knowledge actually enhances our, our appreciation of a movie. And the same with music, arrangement, tracks, etc. So 
I would like people to look at a piece of design and say, hmm, that's polyurethane. Ooh, you know? And it's like, I know that it's silly, but I enjoy that very much. You know, wow, that's rotation molding. Or I really like your trash cans around Dublin. So I don't know. It's really, I go about life being always fascinated by stuff, by objects. Uh, because I know a little bit about, about the background. I would love people to have the same richness of experience, that's all. So I agree with you. There's one at the back there. Sorry, could, no. sorry. All right. Well, could he's saying that the difference. He's saying that the difference between the examples that I used in a movie is that people get engaged and enter a movie or enter a piece of music. You enter a piece of design too, you know. I mean, a train. It's still, huh? It's still a choice. Uh, sorry, uh, it's it's still at the choice level for the most part with with music and movies. You're you're choosing to consume a piece uh, a piece of art, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I find with design, it's never. That's, that's the missing link, is that people don't believe they are engaging with something meaningful. Well, they, but they the, Mac, the Mac PC debate, as, as formulaic as it is, is definitely about choice. I mean, you have to choose a Mac so much that you have to pay more. Um, but, you, and, but that becomes a really, I mean, if you consider your computer another room of your home or another space of your life, it's a big choice. And uh, every, time, every time you choose a product, you make one of those choices of engagement. In some cases, you can't choose, of course. You know, you get the tram that you have in the city. But still, wouldn't it be nice, even if you cannot choose to know more about it and have your own opinion? I, I think that... Um I think that's like the that's the education gap is that people understand that I suppose that that uh, movies are art and music is art, but they don't understand that everyday choices can be right. Art. So more exposure, you're right. Yeah. Okay, kind of just on the same thing. I mean, isn't it a question of the senses? I, mean, I was almost going to ask the same question. I mean, if if you listen to music, you get an emotional reaction. If you watch a film, you can get an emotional reaction. You look at photography, but but design doesn't. You look at design, so why? Well, you can get an. I see. I get an emotional. You, you do, but you're, do. But, but you're you're <laughs> you're sitting there, obviously, and that that makes sense. Yeah. But why do we not get it? Because maybe because maybe <laughs> I was born for, to do this, so I got to it earlier. But I can. You can do it too. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, okay. But on a on a mass scale, I mean, we were mm -hmm. all uh, programmed to listen to music. Well, most of us anyway. Um, and get that reaction. So, mm -hmm. what has happened that we don't get it from design as much? And Maybe there's I'm yeah. Maybe there's too much. See, to me, it's interesting that you say this because what I always say when I say that design always amazes me so much is because you, you're a good designer, you have an idea, and it's really a great idea. It's perfect, but then you have to go through the manufacturer, the marketing person, the engineer, uh, the regulations, etc. And there are all these filters. And then if you get to the end and you still have a beautiful object with the idea that shines in it, you're really a genius. You know, there are so, so maybe that's what it is. You know, maybe you're right. There's something more immediate. A movie, not really. A movie is such a, a, a digestive, I mean, I know it because I'm married to a, a former filmmaker. It's like watching water boil and it's so filtered also. Maybe a music a little less, but definitely there's more immediacy in other forms of art than there is in design. But I, that's one of the reasons why I appreciate it. You know, I can feel the struggle. There's over there. Um, do you feel that um, intellectual copyright laws and patents and trademarks stifle design by not allowing ideas to sort of evolve? It's such by not a allowing big other deal. people access to them? <clears throat> that I, <clears throat> I, as a, a dreamer, I always say that I wish that all those copyrights vanished. I, I wish that we could really get to micropayments. So every time I say your name, let's say that your name is Nick, every time I say Nick, you get a fraction of a cent, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that would be my dream. Um, huh? 
I don't know. I don't know enough. I've been, even though I've been reading on this subject for ages, I still feel that I don't know enough. I really like Creative Commons. Are you familiar with them? You know, you can you can choose to give a partial license and so on and so forth. I would like there to be a little more control. I mean, I was really upset when I found out that there are companies, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, maybe not because BlackBerry was not as well known in, in Europe until a few years ago, but there are companies in the United States, in the United States, the big cancer of the states is litigation, tort litigation. So there are companies in the United States that do nothing but grab patents in order to then sue the companies that need the patent. So at some point, all the BlackBerry users were about to be left in the dark because a dinky, winky company had bought some patent that they were using to blackmail RIM. So the problem is that whenever you have a system or regulations, they can be abused in a way or the other. I feel that we'll go towards the micropayments at some point, and I do feel the copyrights right now stifle a lot. Um, and at the same time, they also help companies survive, you know? So it's something that is such a big macroeconomical problem that I think hundreds of thousands of economists and lawyers are working on. I hope something will happen. Okay, I'm getting hand signals that we're running out of time. Oh. So I think maybe there's a, a time questions. for another couple of questions in the audience, and we have a Twitter question here as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm just a couple of observations or maybe questions, I'm not sure. Um, one is, uh, I'm reminded of the 1980s and design management, which was quite a big uh, movement at the time, and what happened in the London Business School when uh, it was decided really that managers did an awful lot more of the designing in the world than designers actually did, but had no preparation for that or didn't even realize they were actually acting in that way. And I just wonder about the question of um, popularizing design uh, as, a, as, a, as an important basic subject. Uh, and that if we can't do that in some way, we're never really going to have a population or a society that can make choices around design or even participate or see that they can participate in design. And one of the problems maybe with the work you've shown is that it almost takes it into an even more rarefied atmosphere. Uh, mm. So that's just one, one thing. I'm also taken by the work you've shown, but on the other hand, uh, because it seems to move to James Martin, who wrote a book about the uh, future of the 21st century, said one of the big, if you believe James Martin or go with his theory, was that uh, we had technological solutions for most of the big wicked problems, but our pace of adoption and our capacity to understand and not be fearful was really great. So I, I think what you're doing works to that. But in a strange way, it seems to almost go against the popularization or the engagement with the general public of design. Just a last comment is that I think it's still a problem because we talk about the Mac and I love Mac. I'm absolutely a, a devotee, but it still seems to be associated with a price premium. So when we get that emotional attachment to excellent design, it still seems to come with a price premium, which seems to repeat the problem of it's for select few, it's for people with more money than others, and poor design is really for those who can't afford it. Or it seems to re repeat something that happened in the 70s and the 80s in that way. Mm -hmm. Just so these are, I, I want to answer their observations. Thank you. They're good. Mm. Um, just wondering, uh, do you, um, is there such a thing as too much design? You know, I like music a lot, but I really like to go to a pub without music in it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So if we're walking yeah, around looking at every uh, garbage bin and every street lamp and saying that's a wonderful design, doesn't that kind of ruin uh, the world a bit? No, but you know, you know what it is? Yeah, I understand you. It's tr you can't really escape design, but sometimes you get a pause because it's not interesting. I mean, to me, it's always interesting, but I like it. I get lost. I mean, my idea of a great vacation is to be in a city that I don't know on a bus with a window seat and just like look out. So, yeah, it's stuff, but it's designed. Maybe it's badly designed. Sometimes, you know, it's almost like pornography, like what the hell? You know, like a friend of mine, um, Alice Rostorn, who's the, the design critic for the Herald Tribune, does a beautiful speech about the plastic chair, like the bad plastic chair. And it's so fascinating, you know? So definitely there's too much, um, and, uh, and it's more inesca inescapable than music or other things are, so. Yep. <laughs> okay, shall I put the um, Twitter question to you? Yeah, it's, no, um, please. 
It's from a. Well, I don't know if it makes any sense to read out the audience. Kit Kat, well, anyway, Kit Tausten. And which of the exhibits do you think most accurately reflects what we can expect from the future of science? The ones that were in there. I'm huh? not sure. Maybe yeah, it's yeah, your, no, um, your design, the Elastic Mind, or, mm, oh. or or maybe in there. It's in there. Isn't yeah, it? the ones in there. Huh. I, they're all pretty plausible. I very much liked the one that he tried to crack the mystery of the universe by finding the perfect way to flip a coin. Yeah. To me, that's really the attempt to control the universe that uh, expresses more our ambitions than what, than what science will give us, but I thought so. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, um, so. I think we're going to have to end there, but I just wanted to uh, ask you to give a warm round of applause to uh, Tony Dunn uh, for being such a wonderful MC. <laughs> uh, and uh, and particularly uh, to Paola Antonelli for the fascinating talk and Thank for taking you. some of the questions.